Lace them up, let's start the show. We're digging in with Trish. 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 We're digging in with Trip today. Yeah. Well, a terrific job by Tim Tracy to welcome us into digging in. And uh, momentarily, we will dig in with John Isner for the second time because uh, the great is is involved in uh, the Paris Open, marching on to the second round in Paris. I want to, as we always do, encourage you to uh, rate and review our podcast on all audio platforms and on YouTube. Uh, please let us know where we are at. Please ask any and every question. We will try to answer as many as we possibly can. We can only get better if you can tell us how. Um, and now, uh, New Country Auto Group, uh, our fine sponsor who will stay with us. They have made decision after decision to dig in uh, with uh, digging in with Trip. Uh, New Country Auto Group, boy, they, um, well, they're elite. They're elite uh, with uh, all of their dealerships in New York, uh, in Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Maryland, um, Florida, uh, just to name uh, some of the locales when you're talking about uh, Mercedes, you're talking about BMW, you're talking about Ferrari, uh, you're talking about Maserati, Lexus. Um, they are elite because they take care of their customers from stem to stern. Um, Jared Danucci Cantanucci, family-owned New Country Auto Group, um, they just continue to get better and better with regards to, um, as we're going to dig in with John Isner, Grand Slam excellence. Uh, New Country, uh, the auto group, newcountry.com. Without further ado, let's now dig in, in the midst of his time at the French Open with John Isner. Boy, I'll tell you, he's in Paris for the French Open. He won his first round match on Sunday. This guy ages like an 82 Petrouche. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How's my partner yeah. is? Oh, well, oh sure. Do well. Me. Do it well, T2. Um, here, as you said, in Paris. You can't, if I walk out my little uh, balcony right now, with my long arms, I can actually almost touch the Eiffel Tower. Um, I can look at it, but I actually can't touch it because we're – you know, in a bubble per se. So look, it's not bad being here in Paris, one of my favorite cities in Europe. And I'm here for one event, I'll try to go as far as I can. And then I'll, uh, I'll get back home to the great USA. Well, you just touched on a bunch of things I want to get to. I'll start with, uh, you were in a, you were in a bubble for the Cincinnati open, same bubble for the U S open. How is this one in, in Paris similar? How is it different? Uh, it's it's pretty similar. I mean, it's not a, I guess, true bubble. I mean, you do kind of run across some people aren't that aren't affiliated uh, with the tennis tournament. But all in all, I think the, the French Tennis Federation has done a great job putting this on. The players feel very safe. We've, of course, been tested a handful of times already. That test isn't that pleasant, but uh, it's part of the process right now, as we know. Um, it's, part, it's become normal here in, in 2020, but we're all happy to, to be playing uh, a Grand Slam tournament, albeit in September. This event's normally in May. The weather's a little bit nicer, but look, the bubble is it's the hotel and it's the courts, and that's it. Uh, there's no going out to dinner, which is a real shame because that's one of my favorite parts you know, about being in Europe is just to experience the city, experience the uh, cuisine as much as I possibly can. But of course, we don't, we don't have that going on this year. And no doubt about it. Uh, boy, I love that town, too. You, you mentioned just quickly, uh, partner, the, the test and how unpleasant. Are they going up your nose? Yeah. Because the reason I ask is a girl that I dated and talked to you about, thank God it didn't work out. You've, da you've dated she a lot of girls, T2. Oh, my gosh. No kidding. <laughs> you know what? They're all great experiences. But it was actually because she, you know, Christmas one year, is from Paris. She decided to get a nose job. All right. I have no idea. She already had a beautiful nose. She might want to try to, you know, figure out why she needed that. But you made me think of that when you talked about the unpleasant <laughs> nature of the COVID test. <laughs> Tangent. Uh, is, 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 she, is she a listener um, of, of digging in trip? 
I would say she's a covert Navy SEAL listener. That would be my okay, suspicion. There we go. All right. All right Post stuff. nose job. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of the bubble, never asked you this, and then we'll get to some more substantive matters. Uh, were you a Seinfeld fan and specifically the episode on the bubble boy? You know what? Uh, I'm ashamed to say that I actually wasn't the biggest Seinfeld fan growing up. I, I don't, I, I can't recall that episode you're talking about. And it's kind of weird because my all time favorite show is Curb Your Enthusiasm. Of course, LD created Seinfeld. So I can't, I uh, cannot recall that episode. Um, if you want to talk about Curb Your Enthusiasm, I can do that all day long. Well, if I can, I'll get to it. Uh, I, I do want to get to, um, so you got, you played Sunday, you had a, you know, a nice win on clay. You haven't played on clay in a couple of years. When did you get to Paris? I got to Paris on Wednesday morning. So I flew Tuesday late afternoon, landed early Wednesday morning. We had to go through a, you know, 20, 18 to 24 hour self-isolation period until your first test comes back negative. So I, I sat in this hotel room, which really isn't that big, uh, for about 24 hours when I first got to Paris. That was on Wednesday. And so I had my first practice on Thursday, and I was able to play on Sunday. This is the only Grand Slam where the first round is stretched out over three days. Most Grand Slams start on Monday. French Open has a Sunday start, and I was really, really wanting to play on Sunday. And sure enough, I did and was able to get off the court uh, in pretty quick fashion and you know, get back to the room and, uh, and watch some football. Watch some football. Uh, you flew in from uh, Dallas. Um, I don't even know the, the great friends that we've become. If you're a Cowboys fan, of course, I'm a fan of America's no. team, the Detroit lions. What are you a Panthers fan? Oh, I'm Panthers through and through. I mean, yeah. I am, it's, it's Canes and it's Panthers and it's Georgia Bulldogs football. Those are my three teams and that's it. Yeah. Well, I'm a Bulldog fan because of you, even though I'm actually considering, you know, you got to follow the great Fred Labradoodle, new Instagrammer. Um, oh, that's let's, right. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about, all right, all right, I'm 5'9", you're 6'10". Mm -hmm. I don't know who maestroed and was the architect behind these European showers, all no. right? How are you maneuvering those? Because they are ridiculously conceptualized and executed, to be completely blunt. Yeah, well, you know what? I actually have a, a rain shower, so I fit in, in the shower decently. There are, now, there are plenty of European hotels I've been at where I'm bending over, and it's very a very uncomfortable shower. But I have one of these. It's like the half shower. I sent a tweet out about it a couple days ago. I don't understand the purpose behind the half shower. Every time I shower, even I'm taking a quick shower because my bathroom's going to flood if I'm in there for more than three or four minutes. So – uh, it's one of those deals I get out and the floor is sopping wet. I got to use a bunch of towels to soak up all the water. Never understood that. It seems like it's the uh, prevailing, prevailing theme of European showers. And I got one of those again. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's much better uh, showering back home in America, I would say. Yeah, it makes me think about it. I'm trying to think some of my experiences over there in Paris, the city of love. I think I might have adjourned to the bathtub. Uh, and, of course, the American historians we are. Of course, President Taft got stuck in a bathtub. Uh, yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, right. He's the only one. Now, tomorrow, uh, do you know what time you're playing uh, yet? Sebastian Corda. Tell me about this, mm -hmm. this young American. His dad was a, a fine tennis player himself. Yeah. His dad was a, was a Grand Slam champion. So his dad from the Czech Republic. And they are actually a, a pretty big hockey family. I think Sebastian played some hockey growing up. Uh, he's got incredible pedigree, and he comes from a very athletic family. His two sisters are both superstars on the LPGA Tour. And now you have Sebastian making waves on the, on the ATP Tour. So he's a young guy, much younger than I am. And it'll be a cool experience for, for me to, to play against him because – in 10 years' time, I'll be watching him on TV. I will not be playing tennis anymore. So it's definitely uh, old versus young, but he's got a lot of confidence. He came through qualifying, which is no easy feat. So he won three matches in qualifying, and then he beat 
a very good Italian player uh, in his first round. So I'll certainly have my hands full. It'll be a fun match. We get along pretty well. I've practiced with him a handful of times. And, uh, of course, I've never played him before, but looking forward to the challenge. You know, partner, sorry if I, you know, I'm of the mindset. The only stupid question is the one you don't ask. And, you know, you've you won the longest match in tennis history on grass. Uh, you've had great success, including winning in Miami, which is essentially, in my view, a major on, on the hard court. Uh, Rowan Garros is clay. Tell me, you know, what's different on clay? Well, clay, well, especially this year, if you can see outside, it is very wet and very damp. Now, clay is the only surface that you can play on if it's sprinkling. And it's sort of been sprinkling for four days now. It's, it would, you know, it would rain, rain very, very hard. They put the tarps on and then that would stop. And so clay is the only surface that you can play you know, you can finish a match with, with these, with this damp weather. So that's what we have going on here in, in uh, cold Paris right now. It makes the court play, play a little bit slower, which actually I don't mind. A lot of people um, have the, the wrong, I guess, version of myself is that I like to play on fast courts and that's really not the case. I would prefer to play on slow courts. So these courts that, here in Paris are, are pretty slow right now because the, the weather is, is pretty cold. And, and I don't mind it because I like my serve on really any surface, whether it's grass or fast hard court or a slow clay court. Um, I like my serve. I'm going to take my serve against anyone I play against. And when the court's a little bit slower because I'm such a big guy, it gives me more time to uh, go after my shot. So I played a pretty good match on Sunday, considering I hadn't played on this surface in, in quite a while and uh, been getting a, Feeling, I guess, a lot more comfortable um, in practice and looking forward to a good match tomorrow. You know, you and I, when we've dug in before um, and all the, the infinite times we've talked offline, you, know, you mentioned that it, it, sometimes you prefer to be, you know, playing in the heat. You're a Georgia Bulldog. Yeah. Um, you, you're a Texan um, and, of course, a Kaniac. But, you know, you, you pointed to one match against Novak Djokovic, I believe, in Shanghai where it was cool. So yeah. how, how does, how do you is, how do you partner? How do you adjust? Cause I know we're in the fall right now in Paris and it probably yeah. is damp and brisk. Yeah. Well, you have to adjust. You got a, a, a big uh, important piece of that is to get the string tension in your rackets. Right. Now, as I've gotten older, my string tension has gone way, way down throughout my career. I used to string rackets and, you know, for, people that don't know much about tennis, I used to string my rackets at around 58, 60 pounds, which is pretty tight. I am now stringing my rackets here in Paris at, at 32 pounds. So I've essentially cut that in half. Uh, it's just, it's one of those things that the looser I've gone throughout the years, the better it's felt. And especially here in Paris, because the ball is really heavy and the weather is really cold. You need your rackets to be loose. Uh, you need your rackets to have some pop and, you know, the, the strings to have some give on them. And if they're strung too tight in these conditions, that's no fun to play in because you feel like you can't crack an egg out there. So the one important key to trying to play well in conditions like this is to get that tension right. You don't want a racket that's too tight out there. I've, had, I've experienced that before here at the French Open, actually, where the weather has been cold and damp like this and my rackets were too tight and it's, and it's tough to play. So I've been tinkering with, with my string tensions and I'm playing as low as I've ever played throughout my whole career. I like all that. I like the mojo is. I like the mojo. So sure. you've, had, you've had two practice days, okay? We're yeah. taping this Tuesday afternoon, 2 o'clock Paris time. You had an off day yesterday as well. What's a practice day, an off day like? I know you, uh, you were hitting right next to your friend Novak Djokovic yesterday. What's that like? I mean, you chat. I mean, for someone that doesn't know, walk me through it. Well, yeah. I mean, generally at a Grand Slam, it's, it's just one day off. But as I mentioned before, because the French Open has a Sunday start, and I was one of the few matches that I played on Sunday, I had now have two days off. So yesterday I did a workout in the gym and, and practice after that, and today I just practiced. And uh, it's just one of those things. It's actually pretty nice. You don't have the, the pressure of it being a, a match day. You're not really mentally gearing up for a match. So it's a definitely more relaxed feeling. I'm a guy that likes to practice early, uh, get it, you know, get it over with and, you know, get back to the hotel and, and chill out. And that's what I did today. I practiced at 11 o'clock. It was raining early this morning. I couldn't practice any earlier than that. And I uh, got the practice in and now I'm 
back just uh, chilling and uh, get, getting ready to go. But, you know, on an off day at a Grand Slam, you want to practice no more than an hour. Some players are different. Rafa Nadal, he's won his fair share of Grand Slams. He, he's one of the few guys that probably practices for about an hour and a half or two hours. But most players just uh, just practice for 45 minutes to an hour because, generally speaking, the day prior, you've played a three out of five set match, which is a uh, pretty physical test. And Rafa needs to fit into those tight clothes, so he probably goes the extra mile. Um, you know, these guys, we, we've spoken of this before. Um, you've beaten Rafa. We'll get to Roger in a minute. Um, you've been very complimentary of Novak as a tennis yep. player. But I want to ask you, the fact that we've become good friends is, um, I, I know that Novak's had a couple of moments he'd probably like to have back, but I get the sense yeah. – because this guy's getting dragged through the coals right now. I get the sense this is a heck of a good guy. Is that, is that yeah. an accurate read? You're, you're spot on. He's a, he's a great guy. He's very misunderstood. You know, for whatever reason, he's not as adored. He's not as beloved as, say, Roger and Rafa. But this era of tennis that I've been playing in for the last, you know, 13 years is, is remarkable. You arguably have the three greatest players of all time playing at the exact same time you have Roger Federer with 20 grand slams you have Rafa with 19 I think Novak has 17 so you know what happened at the U.S. Open the very unfortunate situation you know that could have a huge effect on on history because Novak was a going away favorite to win that event that unfortunate incident happened so of course he did not win the U.S. Open so you have all three of these guys playing at the same time chasing that grand slam record they're all three unique in their own ways they're three amazing people. I know them all very well. Of course, we know about how great of a, you know how great of a champions they are on the court. But the, the time they spend uh, taking care of others off the court and raising money off the court is is pretty spectacular. These guys are, are asked a lot of. Um, they got to take care of the business on the court, and everyone wants to speak to them off the court. And they do such a great job. And Novak does an incredible job of that as well. He's just a little misunderstood in my opinion, but I can tell you firsthand, he is an incredible guy with a huge heart. Uh, we're very lucky to have him in the game. I want to ask you, uh, I'm going to go a step further with those three guys because you're very friendly, friendly with all three. Um, you're the top American tennis player. You have been on the men's side for, for several years now. Uh, is there one story, let's start with Novak, is that, you know, whether it's humorous uh, whether it's serious, that reflects the type of person that he is that you've shared with him that comes to mind. Well, yeah, I mean, he is, uh, his nickname is, is the Joker. Uh, you know, I mean, it obviously fits his name perfectly, but he's a guy, he is always, you know, he's always joking around. Of course, he's very serious on the court, but he's goofy as can be off the court. I think all three of those guys are, are exactly like that. But, you know, Novak is a guy that he, he doesn't really just – you know, stick to the people he likes to hang out with. He branches out and he's very, very nice to, to all the other players. And, you know, and he's just very good and funny guy. And he, he leads the charge in, in men's tennis right now as, as our number one player. So the players, you know, my fellow players and myself included have the utmost respect for him because we know what type of guy he is. And, and, and he's a, he's a fantastic guy. Uh, what about, uh, well, I, I should ask, he's not playing this year. You're very tight with yeah. him. When Roger comes to Paris is, does he go by Roger? <laughs> I don't know about that. He should though. Uh, Roger Federer. That sounds good. <laughs> but when he comes he's to a, Paris. He's a guy, I know. He's, he is loved here. They love when he comes and plays this event. He's not playing it this year. Uh, of course, I guess he's taking care of his body, had a knee surgery. So he's gearing up for, for next year. But he's another incredible guy, as goofy as can be. Huge hockey fan, actually. He knows uh, – I think he's real, real good friends with uh, Roman, Roman Josie of the Predators, the fellow Swiss guy. Uh, he's also a huge WWE wrestling fan. Not many people know that. The great Roger Federer likes his, uh, likes his fake wrestling, but, but he does. He's, uh, he's a character. If you would see him, you know, not many people ever get to see this side of him, but you see him in the locker room, he's just one of the guys. He's not serious at all. He's as goofy as can be. And here, this is Roger Federer, one of the greatest athletes, period, of all time. The highest earning athlete in the entire world, you know, according to Forbes, is Roger Federer. But he's in the locker room talking about, you know, the John Cena's match with The Rock the night before. So, 
Uh, he's a great guy to, I mean, great guy to hang out with. And holy cow, our sport has been so lucky to have him uh, be a part of it and to be so dominant for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. Trivia time is trivia time. You just mentioned Roman Yossi, uh, who just won a Norris trophy. And I saw Roger Federer, Roger, when he's in Paris, complimenting his friend. Uh, Roman Yossi married a woman from where? <laughs> How am I supposed to get that T2? I need a hit. About a half a mile down the street, and her father okay. plays in golf tournaments with who? With Trip Tracy. T squared and the divots that you always talk about when I dig in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget that. I still have that video. I saved it. You're on the par three. You wanted to send me a video of your sweet swing. What you got underneath that ball. You, uh, you, you took about a good five inches of earth out of there, but uh, about 145 yard hole. I think you hit it 75 yard trip. Well, I wanted to dig in for you. Yes. I wanted to dig exactly. in. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, Okay, so you told me before, just to finish up with these, these three guys. Nadal, you said, you said Raj Roger in Paris. Um, he can joke right before the match. You just you know, spoke about that. Now, I know mm -hmm. uh, Nadal has the beats on, right? He's got the headphones. Have you, oh, ever, yeah. mm -hmm. have you ever loosened him up with a one-liner when he's got those headphones no. on before the match? Hell, you don't man. even try? Hell no. Hell no. I, I like <laughs> With all three of these guys, as I mentioned, they're all fantastic. I know them very well. They're probably the person that I'm the least close with is, is Rafa. But you don't mess with him when he has his beats on before the match. He is uh, a lot more of a serious character than, than Novak and Roger before a match. So, look, you don't mess with him. You don't try to talk to him. He can't hear you anyways because he's listening to some Spanish music. And, and he's a gamer, man. I, I mean, as far as competitors go, uh, he's the greatest competitor this sport has ever seen. And I would put him up there with the greatest competitors in all of sports of all time. I mean, it doesn't matter what the score is, whether he's killing someone or he's losing, he is competing a hundred percent all the time. Uh, it's pretty remarkable to see. He's got an engine that just never stops. America. Let's shift gears to, even though you're in France, yeah. America. Okay. And I'll start with, before I get to, I want to get your State of the Union of, of men's tennis, um, the great Serena Williams. I never met Serena. Tell me about Serena. That's funny you ask us. Uh, I was speaking about, I, about an hour and a half ago, I was just speaking with her. I spoke to her for about 10 minutes, and I was telling my coach that uh, did I Did you tell her you were digging her. in with a trip? I did not tell her I was digging in with a trip. I'm going to send her this link, though. I'm going to send her this link. I was – telling my coach that she's such a joy to be around. I mean, she's – her and I have always gotten along so well. And once again, we, we, we did today. So we, we can just uh, joke with each other and have a good time. She's, she's a remarkable person. Of course, the greatest champ, you know, female tennis player of all time. And, uh, you know, to have her still playing at such a high level is amazing as well. So she's a great person. Uh, she's one that is goofy as well off the court, which, which I, I certainly enjoy. But we've known each other for a long time. And, uh, she's so much fun to be around. And as I said, we had a great little conversation today and we're all rooting for her to uh, break that grand slam record. I think she's, uh, I think she's one away. She has always seemed to me like an extremely genuine person um, mm -hmm. for your towering, you know, your towering Goliath serve seems like the ball, the ball pops when she hits it. Do you ever practice with Serena? I mean, what yeah. is it? Yeah. How, what's that like? So I've practiced with her. We played it. We played in an event probably about six or seven years ago in Perth, Australia. It was the first event of the year, a warm up for the Australian Open. It was called the Hopman Cup, and it's a mixed country versus country event. And Team USA was comprised of myself and Serena. So I would play a men's singles match. She would play a women's singles match. And then the third match was always mixed doubles. So I got to practice with her for a full week and play mixed doubles with her like four or five times, which was a uh, which is very cool. I mean, she's taken, you know, the, you know, I was, we were playing this big Polish guy. He had a huge serve. He served one like 135 at her and she sent it back for a winner. Like no one else can do that on the women's tour. So she's remarkable. As you said, the ball does pop off her racket, incredible timing, incredible strength and speed. Uh, she, she has it all. That's why, that's why she's the greatest of all time. All right. Is the red, white, and blue and God bless the French flag, but I'm talking about our flag. Um, 
when you look at, uh, in no particular order, uh, John McEnroe, Jim Connors, um, Andre Agassi. I think Jim Courier might have won the French Open. Uh, Michael Twice. Chang. Yeah, Michael yep. Chang. Michael Chang dug in there. Uh, Pete mm-hmm. Sampras um, and John oh, Andy Roddick. Boy, what a match you had against Roddick, I believe, in the U.S. Open. How would you assess right now, partner, where you see? I know we're in unique times, but U.S. men's tennis. Good question. What I've been asked a lot, Trip, but. You know, it's, it's definitely not where it used to be. Of all those names you mentioned, that was truly the, the heyday of American tennis. When I was growing up, watching tennis on TV, seems like whenever I turned the, turned the tube on, it was, you know, it was Agassi playing Sampras, Sampras playing Courier in the semis and the finals of, of these big events. And, you know, it's, it's pretty cyclical, tennis is, that is. And right now, you know, the Europeans are just simply dominating the sport. They've won something, you know, like 29 of the last 30 Grand Slams or something crazy like that. So, look, the Europeans are dominating in men's tennis, but the Americans, we have a lot of players, probably the most of any country of players inside the top 100. There's probably about 13 players, I think, inside the top 100, but we don't have anyone currently in the top 10. Uh, I'm trying to get back there. Of course, but look, myself being the number one American and the, and the players ranked behind me who are much younger than myself, they have very, very bright futures. And uh, we'll be hearing from these guys for, for, for many years to come. So I think the, in the immediate future, in the next five to ten years, uh, the state American of American men's tennis is, is very bright. Very happy to hear that. Um, broader strokes, um, you know, whether – I mean, I don't know. It's right there with what soccer, you know, tennis, an individual sport, but in terms of competing with so many people from so many different countries around the world with regularity, uh, you've been a stalwart, you know, representing the United States and Davis cup play and you'll be sleeping tonight. I'm not asking you to get politically involved in, in, in a debate that's going to occur for, with president Trump and former vice president Biden. But I would like to ask you, feel free if you want to comment, but, I want to ask you, you know, for a guy that is a phenomenal ambassador for the United States of America, America is everything to you. When you travel the world representing our country, the greatest country on the planet, why are you so proud to be an American? Uh, Well, I mean, that's a great question, Tripp. I'm just biased, of course. I know you are. It's the greatest country in the world. It's it's the land of opportunity. Um, It's given myself an incredible, incredible opportunity. I was able to, you know, play tennis growing up and, you know, hone my skills and went to an incredible school, the university of Georgia and become a great professional tennis player because of that, because of the many opportunities I was given. Um, I've had a lot of, a lot of help along the way and it wouldn't be possible with, without the great uh, United States, um, you know, behind my back. And as you mentioned, being able to play Davis cup, for the Stars and Stripes is one of the biggest honors of my career. That, that's a very prestigious event we, we have in tennis. And even though I was never ever, I was never able to be a part of a winning Davis Cup team, it was still such a, an honor to, to wear the Stars and Stripes and, and compete like that. So, look, I, I, you know, the state of America right now, I think over here in Europe maybe can get a bad rap, I think, sometimes. But, look, the, the idea of America is still there. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, the promise of America will always be there. And I can speak firsthand of how, of course, how incredible of a place it is to grow up. It's got everything you could possibly want. It's an amazing place to raise a family, of course. And that's what I'm doing and looking forward to do for the next 20, 25 years as my kids grow up. So um, I love it here in Europe. History abound everywhere. But when this tournament's over for me, I can't wait to get back on that plane and uh, head back to the USA. Oh, perfectly said. However, follow up because you're, you know, with those big arms at 6'10", you could, you could probably reach out and grab the Louvre too. So if you were to paint a picture, because I know you made an extremely special trip to Normandy, what, hour and a half, two hour drive yeah. uh, to the West. And during these times in our great country, the greatest country that we're all trying to come together, based upon that experience, the greatest generation is... Mm-hmm. thinking about being there 
in Normandy oh. and, and, and maybe to respond to, you know, either one of us is capable of delivering the, the Gettysburg Address or, you know, some of the other great uh, moments uh, along those lines in American history, but why that is an inspiration for us all to recognize we're all Americans. We're all in this thing digging in together. That, that's exactly right. And, you know, going to Normandy, that was probably four or five years ago. I had some time in between tournaments and just seemed like the right thing to do. Got in a, you know, we, I hired a guide and we went to Normandy and we did it the right way. It was one of the coolest things I've ever done. And, you know, when I'm on the court and I'm not having a good day or maybe I might be complaining a little bit, I try to sit back and reflect on what I saw on those beaches at Normandy and how our troops and the British troops and the Canadian troops, the allies stormed those beaches and um, fought for every square inch up there and ultimately uh, defeated Nazi Germany. So uh, going there was something incredible, something I would recommend everyone do just to, you know, you, you, you see the videos, you read the books and, you know, you've obviously everyone knows about Normandy, but until you go there, uh, you can't really experience it like, like I did going there. So, Trip, my challenge to you is next time you get over to France, you go to Normandy. I think you had a chance to a long, long time ago, but, but couldn't make it. Um, but now <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have to the next time you get over here. Okay. All right. Fine. You're going there. It's when I was an aspiring, <laughs> I, I, was, I was playing at Harvard, and it was, and this makes it even worse. I think it was the 50th anniversary to the day of D Day, and my whole family went, and I thought, that it was that important to me that I had to stay in Paris to go to the gym. That's why I missed it. And you know that story. All right. You know that story. Hey, look, you didn't have to tell, you didn't have to tell me that story. I just knew you had an opportunity. It didn't come to fruition, but you're going to have another opportunity tripper. So uh, next time you get over here, you got to go there. Uh, that is a promise. And you know what? My brother hopefully will do it together. All right. Absolutely. And I would that, love to go again. I, I went there. I actually, you know, I was a little bit, I did it in one day. It's yeah. something that you really can't even fully experience in just one day. So look, we're over here again, brother. We'll do it. Okay. A uh, couple more things. That's a deal. You can sign that in, uh, permanent marker. Um, when it's normal times in the, the beautiful city of Paris, uh, you not just you don't just play uh, the French Open in the spring. You typically play another tournament indoors to round mm -hmm. out the season. What would be your favorite non-tennis thing to do? Maybe your most memorable dining experience. Um, yeah. You and your beautiful wife Madison. It's a it's a romantic city. What pops out yeah. to you? Maybe one story that represents Paris to you. Well, yeah, Look, as you mentioned, I, I play here twice a year in normal times in May and in late October. The late October event, of course, is indoors. That's actually my, my favorite event because there's less tourists in Paris and the weather is much better. You know, you just put on a sweater, put on a jacket. And you're not hot, you know, sweating your face off outside walking around Paris. So, look, I've, I've, I've probably been here more than 20 separate times uh, playing tennis. So I've considered myself extremely lucky. I've seen all the museums. I think the Louvre is probably the uh, coolest one. Uh, my favorite restaurant to go to, I don't know if you've been, it's, it's just a simple, it's called Le Entrecote. It's just steak and fries. I've been there. Exactly. <laughs> With it's the just girl that steak got the and fries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Every, a lot of people have been there. It's a famous place. There's no menu. It's just, how do you want your steak cooked? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they cram you in there like yeah. sardines. It's really not the most pleasant dine, dining experience, especially for someone as big as I am. But the steak is good. The fries are good. And it's uh, very, very prescient. That's hilarious because I remember we were in a smart car trying to park outside the spot about this big. Can you even oh, fit the smart car is? <laughs> Hell no, I can't fit in one of those. <laughs> and L'Entrecote. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and you wait. And you wait out. You wait in a line. Yes. You, know, you wait in a yes. line for forty-five minutes to get in. It's, yeah. it's, it's more. It's more of of an experience. I mean, the food yeah. is good, yes, but yeah, it's it's definitely an experience to wait in a line in the freezing cold for forty-five minutes before you get in, and then they pack you in there like sardines. Yeah. They give you a salad, steak, and fries, and you're on your way. So, uh, it's it's still a good spot though. They had some type of, if I remember correctly, in that joint. 
they had a sauce for that meat that was exceptional yes. too. You yes. know, and of course the historian that you are, you know, the reason I don't necessarily love French cuisine. There are others that I like more, but, um, and as Americans, Hey, come on, you're, you live in Texas. We make meat infinitely better. Who are we kidding? Um, yes, yes, but, we do. but the reason they have such good sauces is because it was a way to disguise, uh, the, um, the meat that had gone bad in, in years gone by. Did you know what that is? I did not know that. It makes sense because that sauce they have, they can put that on three months expired meat. It will still taste good. That sauce yeah. is incredible. They put, it on the, they put it on the steak. They put it on the fries. You know, they load it up on there. So I hope I, – and I trust that they're serving fresh steak, but if they're not, that sauce can, can, uh, can mask anything. Well, you're reading a book about World War II that involved horse meat, aren't you? Well, yeah. Well, it didn't actually eventually get to that. But, yeah, so it was about uh, these horses that were stabled in Czechoslovakia. There was a German uh, – the German, I guess, you know, they were trying to create the perfect horse breed as well. And as the war was coming to a close and, you know, the walls were closing in on Germany, uh, the small farm in Czechoslovakia, this, this book is called The Perfect Horse. Uh, these horses needed, needed to be rescued and Patton. Uh, sent out a dispatch of men to beat the because they were the Russians and the Americans were coming in on both sides and to beat the uh, Russians there because they would have um, you know eaten the the horses for nourishment whereas the Americans saved the horses because these were some of the most beautiful horses in the entire world got them out of there uh, found and found the homes for these horses and put a lot of these horses on boats and sent them uh, and sent them on their way to America so it's a very uh, very cool story that has a great ending. I'll be ordering that on Amazon here today. Um, and uh, I want to, I'm going to bid you bonjour in a minute, but I, I have two tennis questions and then two more off the beaten path. And then I'll, I'll say au revoir. Um, what's the French, what's the Roland Garros locker room like? We've talked about Wimbledon. You won the longest match there. Tell me about it. I've always, I'm always curious about these things. Yeah. I mean, the, it's, it's a nice locker room. They've actually redone it. I didn't play this event last year. I was unfortunately hurt. And so since 2018, the last time I played it, they, they, they sort of redid it. It's a, it's a nice locker room. It's probably Wimbledon has, as I mentioned before, has the best locker room, but uh, it's a good little spot. They got a nice um, area with, they have probably had, you know, 12 TVs and these big couches that of course, the players that are waiting to play or just have practice that day, just kind of plop down and watch all the other battles going on. So that's always something cool to do. But of course, you know, during these times right now, that experience is a, it's a little bit different because, you know, I think they're only allowing a maximum of 30 or 40 people in the locker room at one time. So they don't even have your own locker where in normal times you have your own locker for the whole week or two weeks here. You just get in, kind of rent a locker for a day and then, and then get out. So uh, it's, it's got a nice little ambiance to it. It's not the, not the most luxurious locker room, but it's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's, it's got some history to it. I'm sure it has a potpourri of bidets. Uh, it is in Paris. <laughs> what, uh, yeah. in, in, in New York and now in Paris, um, what's the biggest difference, whether it be the sounds, the approach, the execution – uh, of not playing um, in these stadiums full of fans. Yeah, well, it's 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 the same thing. I mean, in, in the U.S. Open, I played in one of the I played in one of the big stadiums with yeah. no fans. So that was that was very very unique, of course. And my match the other day was on a sort of an outside court, uh, much of a much smaller setting for a tennis match. But still, there was no one there. Of course, my coach was there and. You know, you had a few people working the event, walking around, but but that's about it. Um, I played a French player too, so if I played him, this French player in normal times, that court would have been packed and would have been a hornet's nest. Would have been like playing the Canadians in the Bell Center. You know, they would have saying "wee wee" at me, but uh, didn't have that the other day. I guess you probably probably consider myself fortunate in the sense that I didn't have a couple thousand rabid French fans uh, cheering against me. But, look, it's, it stinks not playing with fans, but it's better than not playing at all. Yeah, I agree. Um, off the court, um, what would you say? I, I just saw just a beautiful picture of your kids. 
Um, you just celebrated. I know you just celebrated one of their birthdays uh, last week. Mm -hmm. uh, your beautiful wife, Madison. Uh, what would you say is the most romantic thing you've done? And then you can ask me and I'll answer the question. In the city of love, Paris, the city of lights. Ooh. Um, wow. Well, she accompanied me to Normandy. <laughs> I wouldn't say that's the most romantic thing, but that's definitely the thing that we have uh, enjoyed the most because we got to experience that together. Oh, man, we have been uh, – there's this place called – and it's actually a bit overrated in my opinion. It's the – it's called the Hemingway Bar at the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Have okay. you been there, Tripper? Yeah, I have. Yeah, With exactly. My mom and dad. So it's yep. it's the world famous place. It's really small, but it's a cool bar because I guess they're they're mixologists or whatever you call it. He's world famous. This guy who makes these drinks, and he was there and he made us a drink, and it costs about forty five euros for each drink. But it was the Hemingway Bar. It's a place that. It's a very highfalutin place. Really wasn't wasn't my type of joint, but for my wife and I to go there, this is before we had kids. It was a very very cool experience to go there, have a couple of drinks, uh, soak it in a little bit. So I would say that's you know, no drink in my opinion is worth fifty dollars like that. But it was a very cool experience because the place is famous and uh, we had a lot of fun. Quick reaction to that because I believe my dad was taking a nap. God rest his soul. And my mom and I were in that Hemingway bar. Won't forget it. My mom, who coincidentally watched your match at the U.S. Open and looked at the screen. I don't know what the heck you were wearing that day. And she said, God, Tripp, is he cute? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is classic. <laughs> um, oh, man. Okay, so I, I asked you, I will respond in turn my most romantic story in paris or the things you do for women i actually ate huh, durian fruit have you ever eaten durian fruit with all your travels in asia well, in you, gotta, you gotta you gotta inform me of what that is durian fruit almost looks like a cantaloupe but it's got pork it looks like porcupine stuff you know the the needles on the outside it smells so badly they will mm -hmm. not allow it on commercial planes it's okay. i believe technically i mean it's an asian dessert very desired it stinks i mean whatever you know what is whoever has the smelliest I'm socks Google that as soon as we hang you out. are yes you will and whoever has the smelliest socks on the atp tour Multiply that by a thousand, and that's what durian <laughs> fruit smells like. <laughs> and then what okay. does it taste like? All right. Okay. So I'm, you know, going to dinner. It's a big family. I'm, I'm meeting, you know, my girlfriend's dinner, or my, her family, excuse me. And I'm speaking. I learned a good amount of French. I didn't speak. It was Vietnamese. And I'm like, you know, they said, they said, trip. Do you want to try some durian fruit? She looks at me and she goes, baby, have some durian fruit with my family. And I swear I could have thrown up all the way down the Champs-Elysees. You got to Google it. These are the things you do for women. So it, would, it was my attempt at the most romantic thing that you could ever do. I mean, again, yeah. it is. Smelliest socks on the tennis tour, multiply it by. It's that bad. A, that bad. <laughs> wow. All right. and, and the taste, taste was that bad too? I don't know. I was just trying to get it to the back of my esophagus and then, you know, drink a glass of wine. So I didn't taste it. <laughs> that is classic. Yeah. It was a good effort. That was it. Uh, last thing uh, I think I saw on Twitter. Um, tell me about, uh, aren't you debuting some new threads over there? Yeah. Yeah, I am. It's sort of a, being a Georgia Bulldog, it kind of hurts me to say this. It's sort of got this Georgia Tech theme to it. It's got it's like a black and gold. It's a great looking kit. Uh, Fila has done a great job with it. Unfortunately, you know you can't wear it in front of a lot of fans. But it, look, it's a it's a good little kit, and I wore something different at the U.S. Open. Uh, in normal times, I would have worn this in a lot more events, but this this is very likely this could be my last tournament of the year. So. I'll try to uh, stay in these threads as long as I possibly can. 
I showed you some potential hats that may arrive as yeah. soon as today for digging in. What yeah. color scheme are you going with? Your Fila color scheme, which coincidentally is pretty darn close to the, uh, you know, the, the hurricanes and the great Kaniac. Is that, is that the scheme you're looking for on the hat you got coming? Yeah. Like, I mean, I think if you can keep, you know, a, a red and black theme, would be awesome. Keep that hurricane red and black, Georgia Bulldog red and black, and a digging in hat. That's perfect, partner. Well, you'll have it coming. Um, you, know, I, you know what? I don't say that. You know what? I'm getting a lot of heat from my friends is they're saying that all I do is make every, you know, I make everybody, I'm so complimentary. I'm digging in, you know, but I truly, you know, you guys have grown very close. So I'm going to get yeah. a lot of heat. I'm going to get a lot of heat for this. I'm going to get a ton of heat, but I'm going to say it nonetheless. Is je t'aime. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Uh, you have anything for me as I wish you uh, good luck, bon chance uh, tomorrow. Thank you, partner. Uh, look, I appreciate that. And I guess no one knows when the hockey season is going to start back up. It just ended yesterday. But uh, look, let's just, we all, you and I always stay in touch for everything that is uh, the Carolina Hurricanes. So, uh, I can't wait for this this new season to start. We we all know the Canes have uh, have a lot of promise, so we'll be looking forward to that. Do you? Can you? And those big shoulders, can you handle this? Because you did Sebastian Corda, I believe, is a Bruins fan. All right, yeah. you're playing him tomorrow. Can you send a message? I know that we don't. That the next hockey season is going to be for a little bit, but you beat him. You send a message to the Bruins that the Canes, just like the Tampa Bay Lightning did, are ready to take that next step. Exactly right. So that's hopefully going to be the Canes next year. So little, it's little Bruins versus uh, Hurricanes on the red clay in Paris tomorrow. Should 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 be good. Yep, and I will always take the guy that has his PhD. You know, really on the board of directors of every earth moving company when it comes to uh, having his black belt and digging in. Dig in is good luck, partner. I'll see you soon. All right. Thanks to you too. Pleasure. Well, Admiral. Uh, what do you got for me, partner? Uh, let's go to the Q&A. So Cole Miller wants to know, who's the biggest Kaniac not affiliated with the team? Oh, I – wow. Admiral, you are good. You are premier. I, I mean, I'm sitting here thinking. I, I absolutely have to think it's, it's John Isner. And I'm not just saying this because he was just a guest on the show. I think it's John Isner um, for a couple of different reasons. He's been a Kaniac since the Greensboro days. Um, that's when he first fell in love with the team. He's been consistently passionate. He doesn't miss a game. Um, he's hockey educated. So, Cole, I, I would have to – there's some – God, there's some phenomenal candidates. I mean, I think it's uh, – it's all the great uh, Kaniacs that have been around since Greensboro. Um, I think of a guy that just came out with uh, uh, U-Time. What a grand slam of a song that is. Former dig-in guest, Scotty McCreary. Um, you know, but there, there are celebrity Kaniacs, and then there are the, the foot soldiers and everything in between. Um, but I think that's – I think I'll just focus on the fact that that's a terrific question for this particular episode. Um, because both literally and figuratively, John Isner is a monstrous Kaniac. Admiral? Next up, Jeff Phillips wants to know if you care to share your most embarrassing TV moment. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, it, it would have been, um, what is it, Admiral? Two years ago? Yeah, it's got to be two years ago, because you were with me. Uh, it. It was a road trip, and I want to say, where the heck did it, did it begin in Arizona? Then maybe it went Arizona, Vegas, St. Louis, Chicago. And <laughs> I was wearing what would be my typical uh, fat suit, um, but it was a little snug by the time we got to St. Louis. And we had our production meeting uh, down by the locker rooms two hours before the game. And I was walking down the hallway to go to the press elevator up to press row. And I saw, uh, a, you know, a, a super friend, um, the color analyst for the St. Louis Blues, Darren Pang. 
and I hadn't seen him that morning morning at the pregame skate. So I was walking by, and I saw the last second. I heard him say, Tripper, Tripper. And I turned, I tight turned, and I split my pants. Um, so, you know, I go up to the booth. I've split my pants. Probably too much information, but you have to be complete, and you have to fully dig in on this story. I may or may not have been going commando. So I'm sitting there, and I only – I remember my first year broadcasting in the late 90s, I would probably, for a four-game trip like this, I'd probably br bring four suits. Now I, I, I lean manufacturing when it comes to what I pack. So I had one suit, and so now I've got a split right, you know, in the, uh, the plumber's area going all the way down in the back. And I turned to John Forslund and I said, John, what do you think? Can I get away with, with, with wearing these pants? And he said, no, you can't because you've got to go down to the bench and interview Michael Furlan. And the way you're going to be positioned, you know, your, your, your caboose is going to be to the entire lower bowl. <laughs> so based on all those factors, I had to change into Lululemons and then wear Lululemons uh, in the game in Chicago. Uh, as well. It, uh, based on where the split was um, in the pants, I could, even our tremendous equipment crew, uh, couldn't sew them up. So that was probably my most uh, embarrassing moment when the pants split. What do you think, Admiral? <laughs> I remember that well. That was uh, quite an experience of the Lululemons. Um, <laughs> Jenna Crawl would like to know, what's your favorite Taco Bell menu item? Um, three finalists, uh, would be, uh, and two of them are going to be gone. I believe one of them's already gone and that's the beef Mexi Mel. I like that because, you know, if you're, if you're famished as I am oftentimes after the game and you don't, and you, you know, you go to the Taco Bell drive through even if you leave, live 10 minutes away or even less than that, as I do, you need to eat something on the way home and Taco Bell is tough to eat on the go. So the beef Mexi Mel, you know, you could, it could do the job really, really good. Um, but also you could, you know, you wouldn't make a mess. So you could always polish off two or three of those, you know, in a six or seven minute drive before you could really dig in once you got to your, uh, your kitchen at home. Uh, the Mexican pizza uh, would always be, um, would be right up there at the top of the list. You got to eat that quick because uh, it loses its crispiness, I think, fairly, fairly soon after purchase. And the one other one, I think, um, here on this episode, we were talking to John Isner about some of the great French sauces. Um, I would say that um, the steaks off taco uh, would be something that would round out the trifecta. Yes, for my favorite three. Uh, if I had to choose between all three of those, who wins? Probably the Mexi Melt. And that's why I asked uh, Governor Roy Cooper to see if he could bring it back. It was a lot of fun. Boy, I hope by the time this episode airs that uh, you are digging in on the clay, marching on uh, at Roland Garros. Uh, thank you so much to the New Country Auto Group, uh, newcountry.com, uh, the great Jared the Nooch Cantanucci. Uh, they have continued to consistently and uh, loyally dig in with us as, uh, as we build our show. Dealerships in New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Maryland, Florida. Mercedes, um, BMW, Ferrari, Maserati, Lexus. It just goes on and on and on. Oh, I mentioned during the uh, podcast, uh, could John Isner fit in a smart car? They have smart car dealerships. I know one in particular in West Palm Beach. Um, not typically my bag, but I do drive smart cars when I am in Paris because um, I'm a guy that's very comfortable in my own skin. Newcountry.com, uh, the premier new country auto group uh, again i uh, want to encourage you to rate and review the show uh, all audio platforms on youtube um, ask us questions as we just did we will um, answer them uh, as many as we can anything you want to throw at us until the next time thank you so much for digging in uh, wherever you may be we're digging in with trip today yeah Today, yeah. Today, yeah. Today.